Uh, order, end of question time. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Item 1, resumption of debate on the Children and Young Persons Amendment Bill. Uh, the question is that the bill be now read a second time. Professor Lim Samson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I declare my interest as a member of the Media Literacy Council. I stand in staunch support of the Children and Young Persons Amendments Bill. I especially welcome the provisions to further protect the identity of the child. As it stands, the Children and Young Persons Act restricts the publication and broadcast of any information relating to court proceedings involving children and young people aged 16 and below that reveals their names, images, addresses, schools or other particulars. With this change, this protection will be extended to children aged 17 and 18. In so doing, we can therefore insulate our young people a little longer from media coverage of their offences and our efforts to rehabilitate and reintegrate them will be far more effective. How so? Research from the U.S. shows that media coverage of juvenile offences that fails to protect the identities of young offenders can have various detrimental consequences. First, the public shaming of young offenders can heighten tensions within their families and fracture the very unit of society that can play a pivotal role in these youth rehabilitation. Second, media coverage can lead these youths to be ostracized by their peers and teachers, thus crippling community-based rehabilitation measures. Third, negative media coverage can also lend offenders a semblance of celebrity status. In an era where it seems to be cool to go viral, whatever the reason, media coverage of juvenile offenses may encourage the tendency to re-offend and possibly influence other youths to commit similar crimes to attain notoriety and peer affirmation. Indeed, my own research on the social media practices of juvenile offenders in Singapore reveals an interest among some youths to project a cool and tough image online by boasting of their misdemeanors on social media. One boy in my study had even shared a newspaper report of his crime on his social media accounts until his social worker cautioned him that it was very foolish to do so. Finally, public records of these offences severely compromise these youth's future chances for education and employment. Indeed, given the replicability and durability of online images and reports, it is extremely difficult to rewrite one's personal history. Extending identity protection to the age of 18 is therefore a timely and enlightened move, given that our public identities assume an oversized importance in our digitally connected society, as we concluded in our debate on the Protection from Online Harassment Act in May. With two additional years of confidentiality for young offenders, we can derive considerable social and developmental returns in our internet-saturated society. Indeed, given our society's growing technologization, I would like to take this opportunity to raise the issue of the digital rights of children. At first brush, you may find it laughable to speak about digital rights for young people in Singapore, since everywhere we turn, it seems like every toddler, teen and young adult seems to be attached to a digital device of their own. Access is clearly not the issue here. In fact, a Google survey found that Singaporean children get their first internet-connected device at the age of 8, below the global average of 10, making them among the youngest in the world to go online. What is of urgent import is that children be accorded rights to the necessary protections in a rapidly and ferociously digitalizing world. By that, I refer to how young people are increasingly the target of commercial exploitation in the online world. Principally, our society needs to ensure that children enjoy rights to privacy and not have their data harvested and mined for profit. The same Google survey found that teachers here are more worried than parents about cyberbullying, while 
parents are most concerned about their children's privacy and security online. Children's privacy and security online is indeed a matter that requires closer attention. Take the example of the Internet of Toys. In January 2018, American electronic toy company VTech was fined $650,000 by the United States Federal Trade Commission for failing to protect the privacy of children using its gadgets. Children use the company's Kids Connect app in a conjunction with these electronic toys. Through this app, VTech collected a vast trove of information, including children's names, contact information, photographs and audio files, without seeking consent from parents or even informing them. A security breach revealed that the company had failed to secure their young users' data, allowing hackers untrammeled access. As children are using digital devices at ever younger ages, we need to hold companies to task for their data collection processes, especially those pertaining to children, by introducing requirements for greater care and transparency in their practices. Companies must also be urged to present their terms and conditions in a far more child-friendly and accessible manner so that young people know what they are signing up for when they use online services. Even for companies that do have adequate data protection measures, we must consider how such data is used to develop algorithms to create or serve up more content targeted at children. Gaming, online shopping, content sharing and social media platforms profit significantly from the digital native market. However, the companies behind them often fail to take into account the responsibilities they have towards these young users and simply find more ways to engage them for longer periods and with ever more alluring content that resonates with their interests. Young people then find themselves irresistibly drawn to these platforms, often using their digital devices excessively. The burden is then shifted to schools and parents who must persuade or even coerce young people to better to manage their use of digital media. In such a climate, we must exhort ex technology companies to do more to create a safe and edifying digital environment for young people. In February this year, Instagram head Adam Mosseri met with British Health Secretary Matt Hancock to discuss new measures the company would introduce to handle content promoting self-harm and suicide. This meeting arose in part from the suicide of 14-year-old British teenager Molly Russell. Her family believed she took her own life because her Instagram account was replete with material about depression, self-harm and suicide. This, her family believed, <coughs> sorry, Instagram has since pledged to better identify content relating to self-harm and hide it behind sensitivity screens. Closer to home, a survey by international research agency YouGov found that a third of young adults here have self-harmed, with one in ten doing so frequently. So young Singaporeans' exposure to such content and their effects should also be more closely investigated. When our children go online, they are indeed vulnerable to risks. Risks of commercial exploitation, exposure to inappropriate content, cyberbullying and online sexual abuse. And we must do our best to shield them from these dangers. Thankfully, Singapore has not experienced such high-profile incidents relating to the breach of children's digital privacy or adverse exposure to online harms. As avid users of technology, however, young people in Singapore are susceptible to such risks, even as we embrace the distinct benefits they can gain from the digital world. Another key trend to young people's digital rights, therefore, must be ensuring access to digital literacy education to empower them with the skills to minimize digital risks and maximize gains. In this regard, Singapore has done well through efforts by the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Communication and Information, the IMDA, the National Library Board and the Media Literacy Council. I urge technology companies to do even more to support these public education efforts and consider the duty of care they owe to their young users. 
Mr. Speaker, our children are born into a heavily digitalized environment. Many have a digital footprint even before they have sprung from their mother's wombs, with their ultrasound images being shared on social media. That is but the beginning of their digital journey. In light of this prevailing reality, we must take concerted steps towards ensuring that children's digital rights are respected, supported and championed. In 2014, the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child held a day of general discussion on digital media and children's rights. It concluded that, I quote, States should adopt a national coordinating framework with a clear mandate and sufficient authority to coordinate all activities related to children's rights and digital media and ICTs at cross-sectoral, national, regional and local levels and facilitate international cooperation. End quote. Given our whole of government approach to tackling our national priorities, I believe that protecting and advancing children's digital rights with a national coordinating framework is a task Singapore should actively undertake. Indeed, given our extensive experience with digitalization, Singapore can also be a key advocate of this movement on the world stage. Such efforts will be in the best interests of the healthy and positive development of children in Singapore and beyond. Thank you.